yes yeah, welcome so thanks for making it possible for us to meet once again this is the second part of our discussion pulmonary embolism and then it's going to be short so hopefully we should finish on time in case the link drops we'll just put up the last link and then probably i'm sure by then we'll be having question and answer so we'll just do that and then we would we'll close. So before we proceed, um, I'll take questions from the previous lecture on DVT. So if you have any questions you can ask and then we'll, we'll start. Okay. Hello, good evening, sir. Yes, good evening, Chief. Yeah, please, uh, last time we were talking about international Normalized ratio. Yes, the I know. Yeah, two to three. Please, is it the ratio? Is it about the level of uh, anticoagulants in the system? What I is the ratio is talking about? What the is the what, what, the what is the what? What is the ratio about? What is the ratio talking about? Is it the anticoagulant in the system? In the system of the person. No, all right, okay. So with the international normalized ratio, we are basically trying to compare certain things. So there's a reagent that is used to test, okay? okay. So what, what we do is that we are just comparing, there's something called a prothrombin time. So we are going to compare that to a standard ratio of the um, a standard figure of the reagents that is being used and that will give you a ratio okay so we use your what you call your prothrombin time and prothrombin time everyone has a specific prothrombin time okay so we would use that and then compare that to the reagent and once we do that it will give us the INR that we need okay okay so it's talking about proton proton Yes, yes, prothrombin time. So there's so we are comparing your prothrombin time to the prothrombin time of the reagents. Okay. okay, or what we call what we call the the, the control. Okay. Uh -huh. So okay. it's just a ratio of your prothrombin time to that of the control, and then it will give you a figure. Okay. And you were saying if you have low, it means something. If you have high, to it means something. All right, okay. So um, this time around, we are dealing with, we want to see if you are bleeding too much or mm -hmm. if you are what, clotting too much. Okay, so um, usually when you are bleeding too much, the INR tends to be what, higher. And then okay. when you are clotting too much, the INR tends to be what? Lower. Okay. Uh -huh. So then we, I said that there's a therapeutic range of two to three. So when you are bleeding too much, we would realize that your therapeutic range of two to three, the value we are getting is more than what? Three. Okay. Once we get a value more than three, then we say that, oh, you are bleeding what, too much. When you have a value less than two, then we say that you are below the therapeutic range. So it means what you are still, what your blood is still clotting. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yes. So let me, if you remember ratio, a ratio in basic school that we did. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's say when you take two figures, and the ratio is about division. And then the upper figure is what is lower than the lower figure. The value that you get will be what low, right? Yes, but when the upper figure is greater than the lower figure, then the value that you get will be high. That doesn't make sense. Yes. Uh -huh. So let's say if you have a figure of if you have um, a ratio, let's say two divided by three, and then you are comparing it to three divided by two, definitely three divided by two will be higher than two divided <laughs> by three. Yeah. Okay. 
So the protrobin time, that's when you read the note, it keeps talking about PT, PT, or the protrobin time. All it's trying to say is the time needed for your blood, if we should take a blood, your, a blood sample, and then we should do a protrobin time, we want to assess how long it takes for the blood to, what, to clot, okay? Prothrombin is like a protein which is produced by the liver. And as the name suggests, thrombin. Remember thrombus, clots, thrombin. So thrombin is like clotting factor two and it's very, very essential in what's blood clotting. You need that to help your blood what clot. So if we take your blood sample and we do a prothrombin time, a prothrombin time will tell us how long it takes for your blood to clot, meaning if we do a prothrombin time and your prothrombin time is what higher than normal, then it means it takes what a longer time for your blood to clot as compared to what someone whose prothrombin time is what shorter. Okay. Does, that, does it make sense? Yes, please. Uh -huh. It's very, very essential that you get that part because um, once it starts getting conf and confusing, then the whole INR thing and then trying to calculate will become confusing. Okay. So ideally we say a normal proton being time is 11 to 13 seconds. What does this mean? It means that when um, you take the sample and you are testing, okay, we expect that within 11 to 13 seconds, the blood should clot. When we use the reagents for checking prothrombin time, we, within 11 to 13 seconds, the blood should clot. If 11 to 13 seconds passes, 15, 16, 17 seconds, and the blood hasn't clotted, it means that it means this patient has a problem with what blood clots in the sense that this patient is unable to what clots when he has an injury. Do you get it? But then if the protrombin time is shorter, we expect that 11 to 13 seconds, it should clot. But as soon as you took your blood, within six seconds, your protrombin time, we are, we are getting a protrombin time for you. Your protrombin time is like within six seconds. So then it means that your blood is clotting faster than what's the usual. And that means that you have a problem with blood clots in the sense that you end up clotting faster than what the normal population. That is what it means. Okay, so that is all what the prothrombin time means. So if you should take a prothrombin time and you should compare the prothrombin time to the standard prothrombin time of the reagent, then we say you are trying to calculate for what INR. Okay, so once the prothrombin time is what is high then it means the patient has bleeding what disorder. And once the prothrombin time is low, then it means this patient is at risk of what? Forming blood clots. And that is the reason why when you try to calculate your INR and you compare the prothrombin time of the patient to the prothrombin or the standard prothrombin and you are getting a value or a higher value, then it means the patient is what? Is bleeding because the value of the prothrombin time is what is high than the value of the what the normal or um, what do we what do we call it um, the normal of the reagent or the control of the reagent. Okay, but if you should check and then your INR is what lower, then it means that the patient's prothrombin time is what shorter. So then the patient is what clotting. Do we get it? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh -huh. So once we get to the treatment, I'll go over how to assess the treatments using the INR so it will be easier. Okay. Sir. Yeah. Sir. Yes, please. So if, if, if I can understand you well, like, um, in short, a PT means it takes a, 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 a short time for a a blood to clot, meaning long yes. INR, meaning long no. INR. 
meaning no meaning a uh, uh, what meaning a low inr oh, okay. so let's take it again uh -huh. um short pt as you said it means the value for the pt will be what smaller yes. so when you are dividing a smaller value by a larger value what do you get you are going to get a smaller value yes please uh -huh. so um, it's like saying you are dividing one by two. You are going to get what 0 0.5. But when you are dividing two by one, you see what you get. Yes. You get two. Uh -huh, exactly. So that's how it is. So short PT means that once you are going to compare that short PT to the standard PT, the standard PT is a value which comes with the reagent. The reagent is like manufactured by a company. So once the company makes the reagents, they'll put a standard PT on it. So to calculate the INR, you get the patient PT, which is the prothrombin time, and divide it by the PT that has been written on the reagents bottle. And that is what will give you the INR. Okay. So if, good. So if the patient's PT is shorter, as compared to the standard PT, then it means you are going to have a, a lower INR. If the patient's PT is what's longer compared to the standard PT, then you are going to have a, a higher INR. Okay. okay. Good. And then we, yes. And then we say a lower PT means that the patient is what's clotting. clotting. And then a higher PT means that the patient is what's bleeding. Okay. Uh -huh. So it makes sense now, right? Yes. Good, 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 good. All right. Any other question before we go up? Yeah. So it's good. Once we, we understand prothrombin time and INR, it makes assessing your management very, very easy. Okay. And the terms are confusing, but just know that prothrombin time is the time it will take for the patient to clot when you are doing a prothrombin test. So when it takes a shorter time, then it means this patient is at risk of forming blood clots. But when it takes a longer time, more than 13 seconds, then the patient is at risk of getting a bleeding disorder. Okay. okay. Yeah. So today we'll talk about PE. And basically, um, I kept emphasizing that when it comes to the most important reason why when you see a unilateral leg swelling, you need to be worried is because of the complication that can arise from the unilateral leg swelling. And then um, we are worried that this unilateral leg swelling could be a DVT. And once it's a DVT, then there's a risk of what? A clot dislodging from the deep veins and getting into the what? The circulation. So we are basically worried about that. So you take every unilateral leg swelling seriously. Make sure you rule out DVT. Once you comfortably rule out DVT, you can look out for other things. Until you've ruled out for DVT, you don't rest. Okay. So let's say you've done your Doppler and all that, and then it's come back to tell you patient has a thrombus. Now you are worried because once there's a thrombus, there's a risk that this thrombus is going to break off and get into circulation and then lead to what? A PE or a pulmonary embolism, okay? So a pulmonary embolism basically is what? A migration of a thrombus from the deep veins into what's pulmonary circulation, basically. That's, that's the definition. So once it gets to the pulmonary circulation, what it does is that it can either go, and when you have the picture of the anatomy of the pulmonary vessels in your, your head. They can either go and go and sit at the bifurcation where you have the right and left pulmonary arteries. You can go and sit there. Once it sits there, then it means you are in trouble because it's sitting in the middle. So it's basically blocked both right and left sides. Okay. okay. At the same time, yeah. yeah. Please, can you yes. check your network a little bit? It, it, you have been, it, it has been on and off, your, your network. Oh, so all right. Okay. Points, Wait your up. voice goes off and yes. Oh, no, right. I, don't okay, think, so I don't think it's you. I, I don't think it's the lecture. I think it's your network. Uh, all right. You. Yeah, because my network is very clear. It's good. Uh, oh, uh, yeah, I can hear to... you. Yeah. It's, clear too. Here. it's clear here too. It's clear here too. All right, great. great. Since I would have been surprised. <laughs> 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 all 
<laughs> All right, let's let's go on. <laughs> I have I have full bars here. So let's go on. All right. Yes. So as I'm saying, when you if you should take a, a look of their pulmonary vasculature, you will realize that there you have a right left pulmonary artery. You have it there. So sometimes when the clot moves and you are not so lucky, it gets stuck at the point where you have that division. Then you are in trouble because. Now, no blood is going to the left and no blood is going to the right for oxygenation, okay? So then blood that is returning to the left side of the heart to basically be deoxygenated and then it means the heart has failed to act as a pump. You are in trouble. Sometimes, however, it would move through just one of the pulmonary vessels and go and get stuck in maybe the, um, the other lobar vessels so once that happens, then you are going to have the problem on that side of the lung, okay? So that one, it means that it will be severe, but you can't compare the severity to someone who has their clot stuck at the bifurcation of the pulmonary vessels, okay? And as I said, most PEs would arise from the deep veins of the leg, but also you can sometimes have a, a clot or a thrombus moving into circulation from the, the pelvic region, abdominal vessels, or even the upper limb vessels, moving into circulation and then ending up in the lungs. You remember our last lecture, I said that even though the deep veins in the legs are the commonest sites, you could also have the splanch neck vessels, basically you could have the upper limb vessels, sometimes even the cranial vessels as well, clots forming there. So, you have to take notes. Sometimes you have a patient coming to you and one of the things that we look out for when you are thinking of a DVT is to quickly look at the calf area of the patient. You look at the calf area and you don't find anything. It doesn't mean that you conclude there and there that the patient doesn't have a P because it's possible that the clot is not coming from the deep veins of the leg, but rather the deep veins of what the pelvic or abdominal region, which you can't see with your eyes unless you've done your investigation. So it's always key that you have that at the back of your mind, that not all peas will originate from the deep veins of the leg, okay? Sometimes you can even have it from the deep veins of the thigh, which when you look at the calf area, you don't see anything. So we need to be really careful when it comes to that. Um, the clinical features of a um, P, very, very important, okay? Because um, once the patient comes to you, if you miss the clinical features, then you can't make a diagnosis of P. So it's very, very important. Truth of the matter is that some patients will be asymptomatic. Not all patients with P will show some symptoms for you to know that, hey, the patient has a P, so let me quickly start anticoagulation. Not all patients will show you that. And that tells you that you could have what we call what, a sudden death, okay? So sometimes you hear a story, oh, he was fine, oh, he was fine. And all of a sudden he said, I can't breathe. And then he just fell and then he died. P, apart from cardiac arrest, okay, or sudden cardiac death, P is the second most common cause of sudden death. When you talk about sudden death, it means patient is fine, wakes up in the morning, is going to work, nothing happens, and patient just falls and dies. Okay, so cardiac arrest or sudden cardiac death is one of the common causes or the main cause of that. And P is the second commonest cause when it comes to sudden death. So the reason here is that some people usually won't show any symptoms at all, and then quick, they go. Okay. If you are lucky enough, you will start showing some symptoms for us to know that you have a P if you are lucky enough. And usually it comes with this patient who come to you with a pleuritic chest pain. If we say pleuritic chest pain, um, the characteristic feature of a pleuritic chest pain is that you have the pain there is what stabbing, okay? The pain is stabbing. It's like someone is choking your chest with a knife. So whenever you are examining your patient, patient says, doctor, I have chest pain. Then you have to ask, how is the pain? Is it dull? Is it sharp? 
you know is it um do you feel like someone is stabbing you with a knife that tells you the nature of the pain not all pleuritic chest pains are pe but then when a patient has a pleuritic chest pain you also have to start thinking that this could be a pe example if you have a patient who has a pneumonia hopefully we should be doing pneumonia next week for next two weeks patient who has a pneumonia and then the patient's pneumonia is inflammation of the lung tissue if the inflammation extends to the pleura or the covering of the lung, then you're going to get what we call pleuritis. Once you have this pleuritis, you're going to have the pleuritic chest pain, which is stabbing, okay? So when a patient is have stabbing chest pain, you'd also have to think of a PE. So they usually come with a stabbing chest pain and then what's shortness of breath. They can't breathe, okay? Sometimes, however, they would also come with other non-specific symptoms. They'll come to you with some form of abdominal pain. Sometimes they'll come to you, they cough, and when they cough, they see blood in it. Okay, so it can confuse you and you might think, oh, this is TB. Because the patient says, look, I have pleuritic chest pain. I cough, and when I cough, I see blood in it. Of course, you have every right to think about TB. But then in terms of taking your history, you go like, well, since when? Since when have you been coughing? Once your patient gives you that history that, oh, I was okay, and I just started coughing all of a sudden, then you know that, okay, this is not a TB, because a TB is a chronic condition. And before you progress and get to hemoptysis, we should see what some form of changes. But then the patient tells you that, I was fine. All of a sudden, pretic chest pain, I'm coughing, there's blood in it. Then you should be thinking about a PE. Okay, other patients too, they will just rush them to the ER and they will say he was just fine and he just collapsed. So syncope is also another feature when it comes to syncope is also another feature when it comes to the clinical features or the signs and symptoms of P. They can just collapse all of a sudden. Okay, some patients will also present with fever. Some will present with wheezing. So all these things are what's non-specific symptoms. They are not really specific for P. They could be other things, but mainly those who won't come in, I mean, because you don't know the symptoms, when they come in, the main thing they'll tell you about is they have a stabbing chest pain, shortness of breath, okay? So always you should be thinking about that stabbing chest pain, shortness of breath, and a sudden collapse, they've given you a history which is looking like PE, you have to investigate, okay? The next thing is the signs. So as a clinician, what are you looking out for? Once you have this history, then you have to check the patient's respiratory rate, which would usually be high. It will be more than 20. You have to check the patient's pulse rate, usually be high, it will be more than 100, okay? then you have to check the patient saturation. Very, very essential. The SPO2, you realize that it would be what it would drop depending on the severity of the P. Sometimes you're examining the patient, you realize the patient is very, very, very sweaty, what we call diaphoresis, or patient to be sweaty. Because of the drop in SPO2, you realize that your patient is what cyanose, okay? You look at the patient's lips, you realize that the patient lips appear a little bit dark. We say bluish, but because we are dark, our color, you won't see a plastic blue, but you see that the pink area of the lips, when you look at the inner aspect of the lips, will start, it will start looking darker. Okay, that is what you see. And sometimes when you listen to the heart, instead of hearing the usual pam pam pam, you hear a different form of beats. Okay, sometimes you can hear pam pam pam. Pam, 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 okay, means that you have what we call a fourth heart sound. Or sometimes you can hear pa, 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 means you have a third heart sound, okay? So the fourth heart sound, usually, there'll be a first heart sound before your, your usual pum pum. So you get something what we call Kentucky, okay? You hear something like, Okay, so the, the fourth heart sound is what you hear there. And then the usual first and second heart sound will follow. 
So that was Kentucky, Kentucky. So when you put your stethoscope at the mitral area and you are listening, you hear, once you hear, then you see what oh, the patient has a, what, a fourth heart sound, okay? So don't, don't confuse it. And usually fourth heart sound is because there's some form of, it comes because of what we, um, the atrial contraction. When the atrium pushes so hard, to force blood into the ventricles, then you are going to have what? A fourth heart sound, which you hear. Sometimes you have a third heart sound and a third heart sound will follow your first and second heart sound. So if your first and second heart sound is, and you have a third heart sound, you are going to have, and that one we say is what? Tennessee, so Tennessee, Tennessee. You get it. So usually when you do your cardiac exam and then you hear, this is Kentucky. So the first Ken is a fourth heart sound, then the usual will follow. But if you have a third heart sound, then it will be Tennessee. So that's the usual Kentucky and Tennessee they always talk about. Kentucky means you have a fourth heart sound. Tennessee means you have a, a third heart sound. And all that has to do with a sort of a non-compliant ventricle or pressure building up in the words, the atrium trying to force blood into the ventricles. Okay, so it's something that you tend to, to, to hear when you put your stethoscope there, okay. So in case the link drops out, quickly send another one. Then, um, of course, we are saying that the commonest cause of a PE is a, um, DVT from the lower limbs, okay? So you have to take a look at the lower limbs, the calf area to see if there's any form of edema. Okay, so you have to check and then you, you, you look out for any form of edema. Okay, okay. Are, we, are we okay with the clinical signs? Yes, please let your question come. Heart sound is called what? Pardon? You said the fourth heart sound. No? I want I want the name. Is that Kentucky or whatever? I didn't hear that. No, the the, the 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 Kentucky is just a way you used to remember how it would sound. Oh, okay. okay. Oh, okay. Uh-huh. So Kentucky. Kentucky. But the another name for the fourth heart sound is atrial gallop. Atrial gallop. Okay. And the third heart sound. You remember it by Tennessee, Tennessee. And another name for it is a ventricular gallop, okay? So the Kentucky is how you hear it when you put your stethoscope. So Kentucky means you have a fourth heart sound, okay? And then Tennessee means you have a third heart sound. Sir? Yes. Are you? Are you likely to experience either hypertension or hypertension between when you are examining the person with the clinical features? That's a very excellent question. So your patients with P would usually come to you de depending on the patient's medical condition. If let's say the patient is hypertensive, okay, and the patient presents and it's not so severe, you might still get a little bit of raised blood pressure if the patient is hypertensive. But if your patient is not hypertensive, the blood pressures won't go up. The blood pressure would either be normal or it would drop. In that, once you have a P and the P starts getting worse, what happens is that your cardiac output will start dropping. So your BP would, what, will start dropping. So for a classical P, which is severe, you rather get what, a low blood pressure with what, a high pulse. Are we okay? Yes, sir. Good. Yes, sir. So ideally, you should. You the question is, if the pulse is going up, then why would the why would the BP go low? The pulse going up is a compensatory mechanism for the BP that is dropping. Now your BP is dropping, so your body has to compensate by increasing your pulse, so that your cardiac output towards will go up. 
So let me break here, send another link, and then I'll take the subsequent questions, okay? All right. Sir. See you soon. All right.